On this episode of Star Trek Universe, this is part one of our San Diego Comic-Con coverage and a little bit extra, right after these words from our mystery sponsors. Welcome to Star Trek Universe, the podcast where you get to listen in while two lifelong friends talk about Star Trek when they're very sleepy. My name is Matthew Carroll. <laughs> I'm David C. Robertson, just <laughs> just tacking away over here. <laughs> I cut my yard the other day. I've been a little chugged up ever since. Oh yeah, I've been down here uh, helping out with the family. And mm-hmm. I gotta say, man, I am I'm exhausted. I, I like brought in a bunch of uh, new furniture to the house today, and. Uh, yeah, I just I've just been doing a lot, doing a lot for the fam, and like it's just wearing me out. Um, but I'm really excited to hear about all the news. I have not looked into anything. I watched the two trailers. That's it. Yeah. So let's let's just dive right in, man. Let's get let's get into all this news. Cool, man. I will sleepily respond. Hmm. That sounds <laughs> incredibly exciting for the listeners at home. Right? I thought so. I thought so. It'll be like a game. You yeah. can see which ones, which uh, news pieces that he reads that did I sleep through and which ones did I really listen to. Yeah. Like I've been super busy this week. Like when all the stuff was dropping or a lot of this stuff was dropping, I was in uh, Atlanta picking Bethany up, my, my wife. Yeah. And then you became an uncle again today. I did. I did. So yeah, I, you know, not that I did anything with that. I got FaceTime with them for a second, like yesterday or something, but. Was it today? It was yesterday. Or was it? It was yesterday. Same birthday as me. That's right. Yeah. They finally did it. They did it for you. <laughs> I figured. They like looked at their watches, they checked their calendar and said, this is the time that we have to boink. Yeah. So we can make the mat day. <laughs> My sister, Ashley, told the doctor, we're holding off until it's Matt's <laughs> birthday. I don't know what you have to do. Put a cork in it or something. I made that same joke to Alyssa yesterday that they like, oh, they timed it right. And I was like, it's their third baby. It's their third try. And they finally got it right. They've been, they've been aiming for my birthday, all three. But the others, they just did the math wrong. Like this right. was, they finally nailed it. <laughs> yeah. They, they wanted it to be special this time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this one will be the chosen one. <laughs> Chosen one. <laughs> uh, well, tell me some. Tell me some San Diego Comic Con news, my friend. All right. So first up, I want to talk about this Picard teaser. The uh, this little oh, teaser okay. trailer. We just see a lot yeah. of the characters, and they had put out these um, these posters of the characters as well. But here you get some interesting little tidbits, like stuff from like you know Jordy saying like my time on the Enterprise made me a better father. Stuff like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Better husband, a better father, a better man. And like, uh, you know, you got Worf saying, do not presume what I've sacrificed for this. Like, okay. All right. I see you, Worf, with your gray mm-hmm. head. Um, yeah, so I, I think it looks neat. I'm excited about that. They had like a whole panel, and they were talking about how Picard season three is going to have a con level villain, which makes me a little trepidatious because I feel like they've been promising that like with every Star Trek for like 40 years. Yes. And that's always what they go to. <laughs> like I remember getting right. like, the old Star Trek communicator magazines and every month they would have like another, here's another interview with Rick Berman. And we're going to talk about the next TNG film. And he would always be like, yeah, well, we're really looking for, um, you know, a con level villain. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I, I immediately mistrust that statement. It's just kind of like, that is clearly just hype. And it's yeah. also like clearly just like, you aren't ga- you aren't the one to gauge that. We are. Mm-hmm. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, us, the fans, will decide if something is a con level yeah. villain. You saying it only adds pressure to whatever you're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it also, it adds pressure. If you keep saying that a character is not con and they turn out to be (laughs) (laughs) true. They did their best to remove all the pressure. Still didn't work. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Kurtzman said, 
that it didn't make sense to do the next generation crew on Picard at the start. But after two seasons of Picard, the show had earned the return of the crew and said the team's goal was to honor the legacy of the characters. He says the key thing for us was that we did not want to have the crew sort of come and have cameos. We actually wanted everybody to have significant roles and we wanted to wet appetites a little bit to see them come back together. So at the beginning of the season, the crew is in different places around the galaxy and slowly we see them come together. But we wanted to take the time because these are obviously beloved characters to see where they are now. And, uh, Gates McFadden later on said, uh, you'll see the ensemble. There's some of us, our characters haven't seen each other for years and other ones. They've been in contact all the time. So you really feel that life has moved forward and that we're engaged in trying to imagine a future that we all will have courage enough to live and go forward to right now. And I, I really liked that. I thought that was interesting. And then, you know, Picard, uh, Picard, Patrick Stewart, said, you know, we, we carved out new territory in Picard. That is the most essential thing to remember. We are breaking boundaries all the time and reflecting life as it might possibly be. As time has gone by, I've, I have found that I have been able to take more risks. And this was a risk for all of us. And we embraced it boldly and passionately and with belief. And then Kurtzman talked a little bit about the antagonist. He says, uh, Terry was very taken with the idea of kind of doing the final next-gen movie, which I dig. I like that all on his face, like, Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. He says, and it was really exciting to approach this from a place of who would these characters be now so many le- so many years later? The kinds of movies that we, obviously, Wrath of Khan is a massive touchstone for anybody who loves Star Trek. But I think one of the things that we love most about Wrath of Khan is the mind games between Kirk and Khan and the one-upsmanship. Yeah. That has been a real North Star for us this season. The villain that we created, we do have a singular villain this season. I won't say too much other than that, except that she is amazing. Hmm. It better not be the damn board queen. I swear to God. It really was. Uh, that's <laughs> it, honestly what I keep thinking it's going to be. Right. You know, the board queen or Gerardi as the board queen, you know. You know what would be really cool? What's that? Uh, the female Q as played by Susie Plaxton. Hmm. Who like mated with, with, Q yeah. in uh, Voyager. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Like, if she thinks like Picard had something to do with Picard uh, with Q's disappearance, that'd be yeah. really cool. Yeah, that could be it. I really, for some reason, thought of Tasha Yar. Oh, like I don't know why that popped into my head, dude. If they did Sela, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. If they did freaking Sela yeah. and wrapped that shit up, yeah. oh my! God. If they if they wrapped up Sela, but also in the process, sort of like gave us that. Not only the original crew, but like the original like first season crew, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if we could see if we could get Denise Crosby back in there for yeah. a final goodbye as as Sayla, that would be fan friggin' tastic. Did you see the thing on Twitter this week that she posted Denise Crosby? <laughs> Maybe I don't know why, because you know I don't. I'm not a Twitter guy. I, I see like not. once once a week, my phone alerts me there's a tweet I'd be interested in, and I almost <laughs> always look at it. I'm like, all right, well, Twitter. If you if you're if you're gonna go through all the algorithmic work to sort all these tweets into the one that you're gonna show me this week, I'll take a look at that one tweet. And this week it was <laughs> Denise Crosby. Saying to at Jonathan Frakes, hey, uh-huh. I did some work for the recent DVD box set, and they were supposed to send me a Blu-ray, and they didn't. <laughs> yeah. Can you help me Can out I with have- that, at Jonathan yeah, Frakes? Sure. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, that's a weird, <laughs> like, that's a phone call. That's a text. That's not a tweet. <laughs> yeah. And of course, my mind went to the, that great Harlan Ellison interview where he's talking about how they they want him to do like interviews for Babylon Five DVD sets for free, mm-hmm. and then he's like, "That's the whole like you know, I don't take a piss without getting paid for it." Speech, mm-hmm. and then he like the cap of that uh, of that whole speech is. And they don't even give you a copy of the DVD after it's done. <laughs> You're like, I'm, it's been out for six months, and I'm like, where's my copy? They're like, oh, well, you, they're in, it's in the stores, Harlan. You can go buy it. No, you go buy it. You go buy it. 
<laughs> yeah, that was just like a weird, <clears throat> sad tweet. For my one of the week, I felt bad. Twitter, do be- do better, Twitter. Right. You're just like, poor Denise Crosby is like, not able to, to afford the... That the, right. the the blue. That's what it felt like. That's what it felt like. And I know that's not true. Like I'm sure that she has gotten other work. Even if nothing else, she's been doing cons for 30 years, and I'm sure she's fine. But like, yeah. man, come on. That's just a weird thing to put on Twitter. <laughs> it is a weird thing. I feel like that was more of a uh because she's been on more of a kick of like calling people out, you know? Okay. Like Rick Berman. Rick Berman had like uh took taken a picture of like her communicator badge and he says i remember the last day of filming skin of evil and denise crosby gave this to me after her final scene (laughs) and and she like quote tweeted and was like that's actually not how that went down skin of evil was not my last episode it was the one where i died i still had to shoot this one and if you'll recall, you came out with a cake and you unceremoniously ripped the badge off of me and said, you won't be needing this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty great. It's pretty great. Yeah. Okay. So this Picard anyway. trailer, I, uh-huh. I was a little, I mean, I know it's just like a teaser, but I was a little disappointed. Yeah. It was cool to see the characters, but honestly, I didn't love the looks of the characters. Really? I, yeah. Uh, I thought they looked a little too clean. I don't know why. Like it just looked oh. a little it looked a little too network TV. And I know that it's like just a photo shoot and like I shouldn't be worried about yeah. it. But like I Yeah, I, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> You absolutely shouldn't. It just didn't impress me. I know I haven't seen these characters dressed as their characters in a long time. I should be excited to see that, but for whatever reason I was just like I, I wish they'd waited and just showed it to me in context of the show. Because this felt a little uh, cheesy, I guess. It did feel a little bit. You know, know those like EW Entertainment Weekly photo shoots? that always make look every movie look terrible. Yeah. Yeah, it felt like that to me. Yeah, those always make me less excited for the movie. <laughs> I do somewhat agree, but I did like the fact that we got new uniforms. We got they're wearing Starfleet uniforms. Everyone except Rafi is wearing Starfleet uniforms, I believe. Oh, okay. Um uh even 7. 7's yeah, in a Starfleet I uniform. Saw that. Um I'm digging Worf's Starfleet uniform. I'm digging his like black sash and I, I don't know. It was just good to see the characters. That's really all I cared about. That's really all I wanted. And we got some little snippets of, of, of dialogue. And I yeah. know that that's not, this isn't what the show was going to look like. Right. So, right. Yeah. I just, yeah, I, I, it, it was, it was cheese. If they had like, I, sometimes I just wish they'd wait on things. You know what I mean? Like wait till you're really ready to show me like what the show looks like, I guess is how mm-hmm. I, I feel about it. But, um, but you know, it wasn't. It's nothing. Nothing terrible. My favorite part was probably um, Lavar Burton's uh, delivery of his lines. They're yeah, just really, really well delivered. Yeah. What was funny is I showed uh, I showed my wife the uh, the little posters because they did character posters of everyone, mm-hmm. and she's like, "Oh, cool! Jordy's eyes look neat." I'm like, "Yeah." That's uh. Do you remember that his eyes were like that in like the last like three or four movies? Like for his first contact, she was like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty great. <laughs> uh, Leah Thompson was the moderator for their panel, mm-hmm. and you know, she's freaking Leah Thompson, and yeah. uh, she directed a few episodes of Picard, and okay. she asked uh, Patrick Stewart if he ever gets to sit in the captain's chair in season three. And he says, that is a complicated question because apparently there are multiple ships. He says the captain's chair, the identical chair on the identical ship. I don't think so. I don't think I do. I mean, there's more than one enterprise and that makes it a little complicated, but we do return to the original enterprise for a while. And I had come and he's talking about enterprise D and I had completely forgotten that in those days we had carpets on the floor. So that's the kind of advancement that has been made. (laughs) (laughs) so yeah he he says there's multiple enterprises so maybe we get uh d and e i I don't know we know that because in uh picard they previously said that the enterprise d was salvaged from viridian three and is in a museum so 
Mm. That might be what he's talking about. Break or they could break it out of the museum to use it like an old school, you know, Kirk adventure or whatever. I don't know that it's that intact. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> maybe they uh fixed it up. Yeah. Like somebody's old car in their garage, you know, they've been working on it. Jordy's been beaming over to the museum every couple weeks to do a little work. Yeah, if like Jordy was like hanging out with Tom Paris and Chief O'Brien and they were just fixing the old gal up, that would be phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um Let's see. Da, 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 da. McFadden was talking a little bit about Crusher's journey. She says, Crusher's been all, all around the universe. You saw the universe from the Webb telescope. I've been all over that place. Uh, it's been really amazing to have a chance to return to the character and this incredible man next to me. Uh, that's Patrick Stewart. And plunge in again because we're different. We're, we've evolved as characters. And it was really a gift. And I wanted to also thank Terry Metalis for the great story. He was our producer. He did a fantastic job. Uh, I will say that this script for season three, uh, I think is the best stuff my character has ever had on Star Trek. I was thrilled about it, and I hope that the fans will be thrilled too. There's a lot of unexpected things that happen. There's a lot of unresolved issues between Picard and Crusher. Mm-hmm. And then uh, she was talking about strong female characters on Star Trek, and she said, it is great to have other strong females. I was great to have Jerry and Rafi and have the chance to work with them. I didn't have that much, but when it uh, happened, it was really great. Man, she's really slamming Deanna in that. Yeah. <laughs> she says, I I had a lot of difficulties with with this man, and then hugs Patrick Stewart. So apparently there's going to be some like tension between Crusher and Pickard. Right. Yeah, I would think there would be to yeah. start at least. Because, I mean, whatever happened Maybe. between them, they didn't like end up together like we always kind of hoped or whatever she was like i wanted to have sex and you just wanted to read books <laughs> we all remember that captain's holiday episode i'm reading books <laughs> about family how do you start a family and she's like i'm trying to show you picard <laughs> <laughs> women in the future don't have menopause until they're 83 that's right we can do this yeah modern science Modern science. <laughs> Kersman said that Brent Spiner is going to be there in the new season, and he's going to be an old new character. Okay. Of course he is. I don't know what that means. That's That describes every Brent Spiner character. An old new character. <laughs> he's just another Soong. Right. No, I, I bet it'll be. Mm-hmm. I'll bet it'll be some form of data. You think? Yeah. They got to do it. You think it'll be B4? Could like be. Like they'll finally figure out how to make B4 work? Could be. Could be B4. Could be lore. Could be some form of, uh, could be lore with like, you know, data's memories. Oh, yeah. Memories. They find lore. Yeah. Yeah. Could be lore with data's memories and like struggling to whether he wants to be more lore or be more data. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here, but something, something with, a. Uh, Something with one of the datas, I, I, or one of the Soong androids, mm-hmm. I think. I hope so. Yeah, I think so. I think that would be more interesting than just seeing another like white-haired dude be like, I'm another Soong you didn't know. Yes. you History will remember me, but you won't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... Th- during the audience Q&A, Patrick Stewart was asked if he would return to the role for another feature film, and he says, yes, is the answer to that, bluntly. I think that would be a very interesting and exciting and worthwhile thing to achieve. And Kurtzman says, I think that in some ways season three is that, but of course, look, if you guys love it, well, let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Kurtzman's like, Picard is dead at this point. I don't know why Patrick Stewart's getting me in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Patrick Stewart's just like, I want to go on forever. <laughs> Patrick Stewart's like, bring me a Sprite, boy. I know I was disintegrated, but I dare you, writers. <laughs> <laughs> This is science fiction, and I am a Shakespearean actor. (laughs) That's my whole thing, you know. Science fiction, but Shakespeare. (laughs) 
Let's see if I can find some Shakespeare to quote when I am rebirthed an- another time. <laughs> My third birthing, I shall read from Macbeth. <laughs> Um, another fan question brought up the idea of someone playing a young Jean-Luc Picard like James McAvoy had done for the X-Men. And uh, Stewart says, I find it very difficult to answer that question because it would mean stepping outside who I am. And as I've been trying to explain, he, Picard, is here inside me. So I don't think it has to be necessarily somebody who lost their hair at 19, but someone with the feelings and the spirit, particularly when he watches Picard and especially season three. Because that's where some of the surprises and shocks occur. They really are shocks. So wherever he is, I wish him well. Man. Yeah, this is his last (laughs) season, right? Yeah. Yeah. Probably for the best. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That was some word. That was some word soup, man. I'm just saying. I'm just saying I love the man. I love the man. Yes, that was some word soup. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's 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 kind of gotten into like a little bit of Shatner territory where it's like I will never play Picard again and then like a few years down the line I'll never stop playing him. <laughs> yep. He is me. He is here. He's listening to us right now. <laughs> it's also become a little bit of like over serious self parody too. Like Picard is the very, like, as you said, the Shakespearean captain. You know, he's like all drama. And the way he's talking about the character, he almost sounds like how Picard would talk about the character. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's just like very, very grandiose. And when you think about like Shatner in his older years, he sort of becomes a little like um, Kirk esque in the way that he's like. No, I'll don't tell me what I'll play. I'll play when I want to play. I'll be the guy. I could be right. the guy forever. Like it's just it's a very like Kirk esque portrayal of himself <laughs> when, yeah. when he talks these days. I feel like Picard is reaching that, or like uh, Patrick Stewart is reaching that level. <laughs> Maybe I hope not. But uh, that, yeah, that was the word soup, as you said. <laughs> for sure. It almost made me think like he's trying to hide the truth. Like that that was a pretty direct question. Is there a younger Picard in this season? He's like, let me swirl words around so you forget what question you asked. <laughs> 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 so maybe maybe there's maybe he's like a crazy old man like a fox, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Nah. That's uh yeah, that's probably what's happening. <laughs> Well, if it, you know, look, did you, did you hear about the, all the stuff with Shatner at all? No. Nothing. Like, I didn't include it in the notes, but I figured it would come up at some point. But since we're talking about Shatner, he basically did, like, this whole thing where he was, like, they had had all these photo ops with Paul Wesley, who's playing Kirk in Strange New Worlds. And then, right. like, but at San Diego Comic-Con on, like, at his little thing, Kirk on Kirk, he got up and just shit on the new Star Trek stuff. Oh. And he was just, like, yeah, he was, like... I knew Gene Roddenberry for three years, and he'd be spinning in his grave at some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So actually, I did see that headline, but I didn't read it. So, like, I, I didn't care at all what uh, he has to say, honestly. But, like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, 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 why? What did he, what was he saying? That's what he said. That's what he said. There, there's not really a okay, context. Okay, so there was no like than, context or like meaning. So not to me, it that. wasn't. It just he said that. Yeah, and I didn't like watch the video or whatever because I didn't care. <laughs> but like that was that was the quote that was given as far yeah, as me. I saw that quote like, floating around. Like I read the article, but I was like, okay, and so that's what he said. All right. <laughs> yeah, but that's like, but this is also Shatner who has never seen an episode of his show. Uh, Patrick Stewart show or any other Star Trek, according to him, at least as far back as 2006. Yeah, I think so, he, he's probably not telling the truth, but like, yeah, no, he's just being blustery, blustery William Shatner. He's got that Kirk spirit in him. Well, based on his Twitter interactions, I think he's gotten in his head that, you know, he's more popular with the Star Trek fans who are like, no, this is bullshit. The old stuff was the way. Um, so, like, he's yeah. just like, yeah, he's gotten into trouble for, you know, yelling about presentism and 
he's uh, openly attacked the Spurk fans, you know. Spurk? The people who, the people who ship Kirk and Spock. Oh, okay. Like, I don't ship Kirk and Spock. I don't see it. I don't think they were ever supposed to be more than friends. And th- but if somebody else wants to think that, whatever. I mean, but for William Shatner to come out and be like, I played him as straight. Your world is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> don't enjoy your Just show like, how you enjoy your show. <laughs> Stop deluding like, yourself. Oh. <laughs> stop yeah stop stop waving at clouds buddy stop <laughs> waving your fist at clouds <laughs> oh man <clears throat> anyway um yeah let's let's move on a deaf fan through an interpreter mentioned how inspiring it was to have bruce horak himmer um represent the blind community on strange new worlds and uh he proposed, uh, or they proposed Kurtzman do the next best thing and cast uh, someone who is deaf. Kurtzman said, it's a terrific idea and it's ter- definitely something that will take it to the next. And then he pauses for dramatic effect. Two Star Trek shows that we are currently developing. Mm. <laughs> and then he also hinted another fan uh, who mentioned how impressed she was with the robust female characters in the last several shows and asked if there could be a spinoff with a female captain possibly led by Jerry Ryan or Gates McFadden. And Kurtzman said, first of all, I'd say anything's possible. And I'll say without revealing too much, you could certainly expect to see more Star Trek shows with female leads. And then, uh, (laughs) Gates McFadden responded with sweet. I do know how to drive a ship. Remember that. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Speaking of a deaf, uh, Actor, actress. Have you seen Coda? No. Oh, what a charming film. It's a really, yeah, one best picture this year, 2022 for last year. Means nothing to me. Yeah, I hear that. Uh, I we just did it. We did the for Bingers Assemble. We did like all we watched all 10 Oscar, uh, best picture noms and like tried to Mm -hmm. just discuss each one and then sort of like discuss the horse race of it all and which one we wanted to win and which one we thought would win that kind of thing and uh coda man it's good it's good and it won and it's like really really uh just a killer uh piece of work like it's a uh an actress uh, or a full family of deaf actors playing with the only hearing person in their family like there's one girl who can hear the rest of her family is mm-hmm. deaf and it's all about her like trying to struggle with whether she sh- should become her own person and go off and she's also a singer so it's like this whole like tension between she's doing this thing that they just can't it's not even like it's it's such a beautiful moment because like it's like it's not just that they think she's being frivolous because it's an artist thing. It's literally an art form they just can't even understand. Like they don't have the sense. They're equi- <laughs> it's like I'm getting, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. Like her family doesn't have the sense that is required to understand her art form, and she believes yeah, she wants yeah. to be a singer. And it's like this, just like just pure emotional like reaction to that sort of like. Uh, thing. I, it's just really good, man. I love it. Yeah, man. It's like rot, like rot blot fan. I don't know what that is. The F sharp bell <laughs> still means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> now you know how I feel. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I feel like I explained myself well. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm I'm kidding about that part. Uh, no, it was a really cool uh, story from Alan Moore in DC Comics where. Uh, this green lantern is running around trying to like recruit new green lanterns. And she comes across this creature in in a part of space that has no light. There's absolutely no light, no stars, no sun, nothing. And she finds this creature who's worthy and tries to teach the creature, Rob Lop fan, uh, what a green lantern is, but because they have no light, he never evolved to have eyes. So like he moves around by listening to, by hearing things. So they basically created, instead of a green lantern ring, a uh, F sharp bell. Oh, okay. Ring. Interesting. And that's, uh, he, yeah. So in his section of the galaxy, he patrols that galaxy as the F sharp bell. Mm. <laughs> and it's made for some interesting stories, but <laughs> that's funny. I like that. I like that. <laughs> but he had no concept of what light was. 
That's awesome. That's really cool. All right. We're going to talk about this discovery a little bit. This was actually in a UK Radio Times interview. Oh, interesting. I thought it was inter- uh, interesting. I thought it was interview. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> um, she, she was asked about some of the criticism of how the series or uh, how to. Bleh. She was asked about some of the criticism of the series. And she says, I love talking about this because let's be real. We are very different than other iterations and we had to find ourselves. We had to find our identity and settle into it. And the fact that we are hyper serialized, the fact that we sort of reinvented ourselves over and over and over again. And I have to shout out our writers for that. There are a lot of changes because the fan base for the franchise as a whole and the fan base for discovery in particular, is a highly intellectual loyal crowd. These are very intelligent people who have such a depth of passion and heart and loyalty to the franchise. And so they have an ownership. They've carried it with them for years and it's meant a lot to them for years. And so because of that, their voices, I think, deserve to be heard. And we appreciate their voices, even if they are in disagreement with us, even if they're criticizing, but I get where you're coming from because this means a lot to you. And it's hard to be different with something like this. And it was hard for us to be different, but I think we've really found ourselves. And I think our fan base has really found that sort of relationship with us as well. At this point, let's not, that's not to say that we're robots and that we don't care when we hear somebody being really angry about something that we've done. It's like, Oh man, that sucks. But at the same time, we're like, yeah, but we understand where you're coming from. And then there are many people who are like, but I love the changes. So there are so many different perspectives. Yeah. And isn't that the whole point is to serve as, many perspectives that's uh that's the whole point of diversity and inclusion everybody's got to be represented so i get it and i hear you but maybe you'll change your mind and if not you're allowed yeah (laughs) it's all good yeah i like how like there's all this point of like we respect everyone's opinions we ain't changing (laughs) (laughs) um they asked about like kind of say that she they've been changing the whole time and maybe they'll Maybe they'll come around to some version that these people like, but I um I respect that though. I respect that sort of like we're gonna make the art we're gonna make. We, yeah, we've been doing that. We're gonna continue doing that, and hopefully, it finds the audience that does love it. And <laughs> we can't focus on the haters. Is not gonna really do any good. Mm-hmm. And uh, she was asked about season five and a possible end game for the series. She said, "Mum's the word. A taser will come from the ceiling and get me." I thought was, I know that it's going to be great, and I mean that. I can tell you that. Lots more discovery. I can tell you that too. Um, when asked specifically about the long term future of the series, um, she says there ha- there haven't been any uh, discussions of an end game. She says the show is definitely rolling forward. Thankfully, but there haven't been talks about the end game yet. We talk a lot about things that we still want to see, or at least they share with me ideas that they have. I talk about things that I would like to see, not just with uh, Burnham, but with others and with the story as a whole. So there is forward thinking, absolutely, and there's foresight being applied, absolutely. But thankfully, we're not having end game conversations yet. So, you know, just a little more iteration that Discovery is not dead. It might be the least talked about thing at this point so she still hasn't seen in game came out years ago <laughs> it's pronounced in <laughs> um so over to star trek strange new worlds mm-hmm. strange new worlds yeah uh tell us all about it i liked this when asked what it was what it was that interested him about pike originally and going forward the actor anson mount says This is a very broad way of putting it, but if Kirk represented machismo and Picard represented intellect, I want Picard, uh, I want Pike to represent heart. And I really think that decision is in the second season of discovery to make Pike aware of his future was a very smart one because it took what is a tragic ending and turned it into an act of choice and the repercussions and the fallout from that choice really helped put more pins into who this guy really was. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with that completely. He talked about how the season one finale was a key pivot point. He says, you know, in that last episode, Pike shows up and shows him what's going on. He says, you, uh, he never says you don't have a choice. He still has, uh, has a choice, but when he realizes what those other choices are, there really is no choice. So I feel like in that sense, having got past that now, the fully fledged uh, Pike 
the whole self-accepting Pike is really starting, and I hope we get to deliver the third act of Pike and find a unique way of overlapping with TOS. Hmm. He also talked about how he saw the events of the finale changing Pike. He says, one thing I was thinking about making that finale is how many stories with people who have been given a terminal diagnosis who will tell you I have never been more alive because suddenly all the crap you thought that mattered doesn't. And I thought it put him in that space. Hmm. So, yeah, I like, I kind of, that's, I guess this, uh, I think we were talking about it earlier before the show and I said something about it, wrapping up that ver that, that part of Pike's story a little bit. Mm -hmm. Navia Erica, who plays, um, Ortega's yeah. was talking to variety and said there will be more for Ortega's in the upcoming season. She says the biggest storylines in season one are not me. My thing is like, I'm flying a ship. I don't have time to have all these emotional conversations. <laughs> we're definitely going to see some big arcs in season two. The payoff will be there. I think we're building up to something really beautiful and really compelling. It's a joy to play the part. Uh, and then on slash film, she says Ortega's does have an episode in season two. We love Ortega's. Uh, one of the great thing about Ortega's is that she fits so well into every story because she's always kind of in the center of it. You know what I mean? I like to think of her as a, the person who gets to comment on every single story. Ortega's gets to do a bunch of things that she does in season two that she didn't get to do in season one. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, on talking about how she's really sarcastic, her character is super sarcastic. She says, I knew from the beginning there was a comic aspect to Ortega's and what she brings to the crew. But what I really wanted to avoid was the obvious comic relief. I always go back to the writing. Yeah, well, I know I'm biased, but the writing is so well done and it <laughs> makes it easy to bring her to life. I could see in the script that the reason she's able to break the tension to have these moments, especially with Pike, is because she is so skilled and so confident in what she does. And I love that she's a soldier and a pilot. And so much of what I've heard from actual soldiers and pilots is she is the most authentic crew member in that her gallows humor is exactly what happens in life and death situations. I see trolls on Twitter say she is not professional enough or she's not this enough, which in my gut, I feel that misogyny. So when I hear from actual soldiers and pilots that she absolutely is doing what they're doing out there, that to me is the highest compliment. The first season explored romantic storylines and histories for a number of other characters, but not for her. Uh, in her interview with Variety, uh, she says... Uh, I've been playing Ortega's to be very much like she's super loyal to her crew and she also has a crush on probably all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And uh, by the way, you had asked whether or not, you know, like what was, what was her label? What was her pronouns um, a few episodes ago? And uh, she's saying here, I don't want to sound like it's a flippant thing, but she doesn't have to put a label on it. I like that we're approaching it in a way that nobody bats an eye like they shouldn't, right? Everybody should be a bit queer. Everybody's a bit queer, I feel, you know, and in that way, me too. This has been my whole life, and I'm so happy about it, but I know I give off this wonderful queer energy. It's just be, been a part of who I am. Hmm. Um, she says, I think we're going to see, I mean, I can't say anything, but I think we're going to see that for Ortega's. If she relates to somebody, if she likes somebody, it doesn't matter who they are, where they come from. If there's a connection, she's going to go for it. Hmm. So, that you know, that that's a little bit of, you know, of, of where that character's coming from. Yeah, um, I see that. Uh, I, you know, I have not enjoyed the character very much. I don't think it's misogyny on my part. I just don't like the character very much. <laughs> I'm open to it changing. Just to just to point it out, like, I just haven't liked the writing Man. of the character so far. But I hope I love Ortega's in the next so, season. So I know a guy who is pretty misogynistic. And okay. Like very... Are you trying to talk about me? No. Is this a story this, about me? This isn't a story about you. <laughs> Not this time. Okay. Yay! I know a guy who's pretty misogynistic and whatever, and like, um, <laughs> I made Alyssa so nervous because he's like, he's he's like married to a friend of hers, so they like, so we uh -huh. we socialize every once in a while or whatever, and he's just like, you know, he just has all the views that are opposite of how I think I see things, and so he came, yeah. he, we were sitting at the at something, and he was like talking about Star Wars, uh, the Obi Wan show. And he's like, uh -huh. he's like, yeah, I just don't like it, man. I just think it's it's written poorly. And that's what they always fall back on. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, you're one of those guys who doesn't like that Reva character, aren't you? And he was like, 
well, yeah, she's written really poorly, and like she just done da da da. She started talking about it, and I was like, "You racist bastard!" And that's all Alyssa heard <laughs> from like across the across the uh-huh. table. So like, I said it in such a way that like there was a hint of truth to it, but also like I was saying it in such a way that it was clearly like. I was being overly ridiculous with how much I was calling right. him out for it, you know? But Alyssa only heard, you racist bastard. And she got so uncomfortable. She was like, oh, no, what fight is about to happen? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> yeah, but you know, those people might as well say, like, oh, she's yeah, it's written poorly. She's written poorly. Uh, for example, she's black and has a vagina. <laughs> exactly. That's not good writing. That's terrible writing. <laughs> we started talking about how she how she's written, and I was like, "So she's this, and this." I started naming all the traits of her that weren't those two things, and I was uh-huh. like, "So she's a like you know, a whatever." I started naming. I don't want to spoil Obi Wan, but like I started yeah, naming all this all this really cool stuff they did with her character, and like I described it in a very like epic way that just made it sound like a really badass character, uh-huh. and he was like. Yeah, that all does sound really good. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, it is. It's really good. <laughs> you racist bastard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so what? What? How, how much we got left? What we got left? Fair amount. <laughs> the old news. The old news here. Jason Isaacs <laughs> uh, says that he has talked to Akiva uh, Goldsman about coming back as Prime Lorca. He says yeah, uh, that. he'd be into uh, doing it. He said um, he'd want it to be a, a good storyline like his season one Mirror Universe secret. He says the story would have to be great. It was a fantastic storyline. All actors ever want is a secret. And I had the biggest secret of all without spoiling it for anyone. He's, he's, he's such a dour person, though. He says, if people haven't watched it already, it's unlikely they'll watch it now. But there is nonetheless a fantastic secret. And I had to play it. And I knew it. <laughs> like Jason Isaacs, don't you know about the streaming? You know about the streaming, right? <laughs> yeah, like a lot of people will probably watch it after now. But yeah, he says I'm working with Akiva Goldsman right now, who wrote and directed quite a lot of Star Trek Discovery on a Tom Holland miniseries, The Crowded Room in New York. We've talked about Prime Lorca. And it would have to be a, as good a story as season one of Discovery. I don't want to come back just because he's a fan favorite and do some version that isn't anywhere near as good. If there's space, they have so many brilliant series up now. Um, Strange New Worlds has been a massive hit as well, and Picard is a huge hit. But where and if there's a space for Prime Lorca, uh, I'm up for it. I don't want to come back just to squeeze into that sausage skin tight suit. i love the idea of a prime lurker coming back because it just would give jason isaacs the chance to just play a completely different version of that character Mm -hmm. um you know we all watched him for a season going like this guy is not very federation and then of course he wasn't yeah no oh yeah he's more like terran empire huh (laughs) Yeah, yeah, a little bit a little bit uh it's like so funny that how many people like that turned off uh, of the show and then you're like yeah it was a ploy that was happening like just watch till yeah. watch till the mid season buddy yeah give it a little time to marinate marinate yeah you gotta you gotta let your shows marinate saute uh grill i'm hungry pressure cook <laughs> no no there's just nothing romantic about a pressure cook you know yeah i guess so i don't know i fancy a crock pot myself Oh, oh, there's something romantic about a crock pot. Yeah. Yeah. Those vegetables like it slow, Dave. Yeah. Those those vegetables are <laughs> a crock pot, not a microwave, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> like I got, you know, the pieces of broccoli and carrots and they're going, I like a man with a slow hand. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> Hey, this is exciting. Uh, on the Strange New Worlds thing, uh, on the panel, you know, yeah. they, uh, they were doing it, and um, they uh, Kurtzman was teasing this big crossover, and uh, and then uh, Tawny Newsom and Jack Quaid crashed that portion of the uh, of the panel, 
and they announced a crossover with Lower Decks with Strange New Worlds. Okay. According to Paramount Plus, the the special crossover episode will be in season two of of uh, Strange New Worlds. Strange New Worlds. That's what I was gonna say. Like that's weird. I was thinking yeah. it would be in Lower Decks because it'd be easy to transpose those characters over. Yeah, but to bring the characters from the Cerritos onto Strange New Worlds is a whole different deal. Yeah, the episode will feature both live action and animation. Fans can expect to see Beckett Mariner voiced by Tawny Newsom and Ensign Brad Boimler voiced by Jack Quaid from Lower Decks joining the USS Enterprise in season two of Strange New Worlds. And the episode is going to be directed by Jonathan Frakes. Interesting. <laughs> that is very strange. I'm so excited for that. Yeah, that's a swing, man. That's a cool, weird thing to do, and I, I dig it. That is. I'm down. I'm very, I'm very interested. Yeah, me, me too, man. What What I think is really interesting is like not only is it going to be like, uh. Live action and animation, they're spanning centuries here. Like, yeah. They're in two different centuries. Right. It makes me think of that, uh, you know, trial, what is it, Trials and Tribulations? Yeah. And I'm wondering if it'll be something like that with time travel or, or what. I just have no idea. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, very interested. Yeah. Especially the fact that it's going to be on Stranger Worlds. That's weird. Yeah. And I think it's like, my, I guess, probably my favorite two. Two series interacting. That's not just Prodigy. I was gonna say, what about Prodigy, man? Ah, uh, yeah, I remembered Prodigy at the end of my sentence. And I was like, ah, <laughs> oh, damn it, Prodigy. There's so many Star man. Trek shows right now. I don't know what's my favorite right now. I really don't. Of the new stuff, I mean, my favorite would always be DS9 and TOS. Yeah, no, I'm trying. Oh, I know, uh, I know, we're, we we got to get off here soon. But I did want to just 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 a quick nod to the trailer, which we'll discuss in the next episode a little more deeply. But uh, they put out the Lower Decks trailer. Man, they're going to DS Nine. Yes, they're circling those pylons. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. Yeah. Just circle just the circle pylons. around and pretend we're in all of the pylons. <laughs> <laughs> then it just cuts to a direct uh, facsimile of the you know uh, theme music. Uh, yeah. Opening or whatever. It's so good. <laughs> right. I, I loved it. I love it too. Just keep circling. <laughs> um, can't wait, man. I can't wait. Uh, and so there's a bunch more news, but we're going to have to cut it at about an hour now. Uh, yeah. I guess we'll come back in a couple more days and do another STCC Comic Con news, news episode. Yeah. I guess so. I'm I guess down. we'll have to. I'm down. There's we'll just- talk about that trailer for Lower Decks. Yeah. Ugh. As the DS9 is the thing I'm most excited for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm down with that. What was that? That was my throat drying out after so much talking. <laughs> so much talking, and it's one in the morning, and uh, yeah. I've been up all day working with my family, so I'm like, I'm, I'm fading pretty good. Um, so, we're going to pick this up another night this week and do more San Diego Comic-Con news. But so we'll be back in a couple mm-hmm. days, guys. Um, man, I, there's just so much to talk about. We just did this from the Marvel stuff, you know, uh, yesterday, and I haven't even had time to edit it yet. Um, so just there's just so much out there, so much is going on. So much yeah. news came out of San Diego Comic Con this year. Well, my friend, thank you for talking with me about Star Trek. I always enjoy it. Yeah, man. Uh, well, guys, we'll be back very soon. And to all of you, I say, just keep circling. Damn it, that's going to replace Joel on True and Live Long and Prosper, isn't it? Maybe so, man. Just keep circling. Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. <laughs>